some of the main things of the somite, some of the main derivatives, are the connective tissue, uh, bone, muscle, cartilage, dermis. And that's really where a lot of these things come from, the sclerotome, the myotome, the syndotome, or the, uh, the syndotome is the tendons, uh, dermatome is the dermis, and whatnot. So we're going to look at all of those derivatives here. So initially, the somite is undifferentiated, even though Hox genes do determine along the anterior-posterior axis whether they're going to form into rib cartilage, because obviously as you go down further, you're not forming ribs towards the abdomen region. So it's only in the more anterior region where you have certain Hox genes that are going to allow the somites to develop into rib cartilage as well as vertebrae, whereas as you start getting more posterior, the Hox genes are going to only allow the sclerotome uh, somite or the somites, the sclerotome of those somites to develop into vertebrae and no more ribs can form. They've shown that if they express certain Hox genes more posterior, you do form ribs lower. And so there is that differentiation going on regarding the Hox genes patternings from the anterior to the posterior. And that's really what makes a big difference um, in terms of why ribs form up here rather than down in the lower extremities. The syndotome is, comes from a region just close to the sclerotome. Initially, there is no syndotome, but some of the cells develop into this region as gastrulation occurs, primarily due to the absence of sonic hedgehog signaling or the low amount of sonic hedgehog signaling. These are going to form tendons, primarily tendons that are going to connect the vertebrae along, uh, the, uh, along its axes. Okay. Then we'll talk about the myotome, and then we'll talk about the dermatome. First, let's talk about how the somites initially form, because the paraxial mesoderm, as it forms, it's just kind of one or, or, or long uh, uh, sections um, of um, epithelial and mesenchyme tissue. In fact, it's kind of got an epithelial layer on the outside, and inside the cells are mesenchyme. So it's just kind of this huge, long tube of epithelial cells with mesenchyme um, cells in between. So the question becomes, how do they form these various uh, spheres of somites um, as development occurs? And it's a really fascinating process. Now again, we know the role that somites play in that due to ephrin receptors uh, and ephrin ligands, um, the motor axons will only go through the anterior regions of the somites and the neural crest cells will also only migrate through the anterior region of the somite. So they play that role in helping other tissues migrate through their respective pathways that they need to go to. Now, somites, they form in similar fashions in most vertebrates, but there are some fundamental differences. So what we're going to go through is just kind of the general outline of how somites form without getting into too many of the specifics regarding any one individual organism some of the same key players that are found in all of these organisms. Though they found that you know, the, the induction method may be slightly different from one organism to the next. Um, now, one of the biggest um, players, so to speak, of somite formation is the notch, uh, notch delta. Remember the, this juxtacrine signaling that occurs in cell-to-cell -cell interaction? So let's look at how this is done, because I'm sure if you read through it, you kind of were like, uh, whatever. Um, there's a lot of things going on if you, if you read through that. So initially, all of the paraxial mesoderm is just one continuous kind of group of cells that are epithelial and then mesenchyme in the middle of it. So the question becomes, how do they start segmenting into these somites that will then form the vertebrae and the musculature and the cartilage and all this kind of things? Um, one of the biggest things that they found is there is a negative feedback loop that goes on almost an exact 90-minute cycle um, of induction. And it goes through these waves of induction. We'll kind of show you the genetic relationship between this negative feedback loop and what occurs. The primary inductive signal that starts this process is typically FGF8. So they found that in the paraxial mesoderm, FGF8 is expressed in the paraxial mesoderm, and then what happens is it starts becoming more and more restricted, and it causes induction of a, of a variety of different genes. One of the genes that they've shown that is necessary for 
the ultimate notch delta signaling is Harry 1. So let me show you how this works. This is the overall process, and I'm going to go back to these and show you what's going on here. Here's the overall induction pathway. There is this huge wave of FGF8 that's expressed through most of the posterior regions of the unsegmented somites. Well, FGF will essentially induce uh, WIN3A, which will in turn induce notch, which will in turn induce hairy, which will in turn induce efferens, and then you get segmentation. So that's kind of the, the, the process. FGF8 to WIN3A to notch to hairy to efferens. That's what they've shown as this inductive signaling pathway that ultimately causes one somite to segment away from the group and become uh, uh, um, uh, these spheres. Well, the question becomes, what is all this other stuff about? And what happens is, as, as FGF8 induces WIN3A, WIN3A not only turns on notch, but it also turns on another gene that represses WIN3A. So this is where the negative feedback loop comes into play is that when 3A is expressed, but then a new, uh, uh, this gene, axin, gets turned on, and it comes back, and it turns off when 3A. Once axin uh, uh, turns off when 3A, there's no induction of axin. This gets turned off, and when 3A comes back on again. So this is where you get the cyclical process of when 3A gets turned on, and then it gets turned off, and then it gets turned on, and then it gets turned off. That's how this negative feedback loop works. Well, before when 3A gets turned off, it induces notch. Well, the same thing happens here. Notch causes certain genes to be turned on in addition to Harry 1, and these will in turn turn notch off. Well, not before, it's already induced Harry 1, and then this will induce this, and so on and so forth. So what you see, what you're looking at here, is over the 90-minute period, as FGF gets turned on, so does WIN3A, then notch, then Harry, then Efren and whatnot, but these get shut off through this wave-like process. They, they show that over this 90-minute period, FGF goes down, Harry 1 goes down, and so on and so forth, and eventually it kind of gets restricted all the way to where you have the next boundary between one somite or the other, and then the process starts all over again. But this happens all along from the anterior to the posterior axis. Once this barrier gets formed, a new wave of FGF, and then WIN3A, and then uh, Notch, and then uh, Harry, and so on and so forth, will start in the posterior end, and then it'll become more and more restricted until it becomes right here to where the next somite's going to form. And this just keeps going on and on and on and on. And each organism has a different number of somites. I mean, you've got snakes that have hundreds because they have all of these vertebrae. You have others that maybe only have 20 some odd somites and so on and so forth. So a lot of this has to do with the overall amount of vertebrae and how long the organism is and, and how many somites are going to form. What's interesting is the somites, the formation of the somites, is so exact that we can determine how far, how long an embryo has been uh, growing based upon the number of somites. Because when you deal with chickens, like I deal with, it, it's exactly 90 minutes, 90 minutes for each somite. And so when we say, oh, it's at the 10 somite stage, you can look through any embryo that has 10 somites, and they'll be at the exact same developmental stage as any other uh, uh, embryo. Okay, there's no difference between where they're at. So based upon the number of somites, we actually use that as an internal clock to time when certain development processes occur. And we can actually measure, say, oh, this is when... The neural crest cells are migrating from here at 10 somites. We say 10 somite stage, 20 somite stage, and so on and so forth because of how exact this clock is. It's just the most fascinating um, process of induction that we, we've seen yet. So let me show you how this works. At the boundary, you get a combination of uh, anterior expression of notch and efferent and a posterior expression of Harry 1 and the ligand. And ultimately, when these two come together, it causes a disassociation and a segmentation that changes some of the mesenchyme cells to become epithelial, and that's what surrounds the, uh, um, the somite. That's how the somites form kind of this sphere, is some of the uh, mesoderm 
um, not mesoderm, mesenchyme that is within that becomes epithelial, and that just causes the somite to essentially form. On both sides, you get epithelialization of these uh, uh, mesenchyme cells. And then it does it again. It moves down and ultimately comes to the next somite, and it partitions that part off and that one off. They've shown that if they've artificially put notch signaling in between uh, where somites normally wouldn't form, you get somite segmentation. So they've shown that notch does play a key role in causing a transition from these cells to go from mesenchyme to epithelial cells. So you can see that right here. You get segmentation occurring in this one somite where you're supposed to get one. They're actually getting two. They've taken cells and done transplantation experiments where they've taken parts from the middle of one, put it in the middle of another, and nothing happens. But if they take cells from one of the boundaries and you put it here, you also get segmentation. So it pretty much comes down to whether they artificially put notch signaling into it or whether they take boundary cells and put it into it, you're going to get segmentation. And that's how important this notch signaling is in the induction process of the necessary genes. Ultimately, it comes down to efferent receptors and efferent ligands that plays a key role in the segmentation. And that's where this comes into play right here, is that HERI-1 will turn on um, the uh, efferin genes that are necessary for segmentation at that particular uh, junction. But it's a huge induction process, and it goes through these waves of induction every 90 minutes, um, always having a reciprocal induction. So pretty much FGF8, you can see how they get concentrated right at that junction where the somites are essentially forming. And then you can see all these somites forming along this axis. Notice, look at the head region. You can see that as the somites are increasing, you're getting further and further neuralation. So you get into the initial folds of the neural uh, tube here, eventually closing off. That's why two embryos that have the exact same number of somites are going to have the same uh, um, progress through their development because of the nature of how uh, the timing of this is every hour and a half, essentially. They've shown that, again, if you take, uh, because of the Hux gene, if you take somites from a lower region and put them to another region, um, due to the induction signal of this, there is some competence and the ability for them to um, form vertebrae where they're not supposed to. So um, ultimately, it comes down to the Hux patterning on why certain vertebrae will form and why other vertebrae won't form. They've shown that if they you know, artificially put Hux genes in where they're not supposed to, you can get absence or um, uh, increase of uh, vertebrae forming where they're either not supposed to or where they're supposed to. So here's just kind of a side view of what's going on with the praxial mesoderm. So throughout this, you've got these epithelial cells that's forming, and then the, the middle of the praxial mesoderm remains mesenchyme. And as the somites form, you'll get segmentation, which is essentially that these cells will become epithelial cells, these will become epithelial, and it just forms these round spheres of somites. Um, epithelial cells on the outside and mesenchyme on the inside. You'll see eventually that these will then become mesenchyme again once they're induced by the notochord and the neural tube and the, and the overlying ectoderm. Okay. Now, it's a very complex process. It's not the same in every single organism. So here are the somites right here. Here's just the, the round spheres of, of somites in their initial stages. Look at all the induction processes from the lateral plate mesoderm, from the notochord, from the neural tube. There's just so much going on here. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of things that we want to focus on in terms of how these uh, regions essentially form. Notice in the most ventral portion of the somite, this is where the sclerotome forms. Okay? So the sclerotome is primarily going to form the vertebrae as well as the rib cage. So the, the most ventral region of, this, um, of the somites is what's going to form the vertebrae. Notice that this is why they're right next to the formation of the neural tube as well, is because as they form, they're going to surround the developing neural tube, and that's what is going to cause the, the vertebral column to form. This upper region up here, this is what becomes the, what we call dermamyotome. So initially, we combine the two. We call it the dermamyotome. Eventually, they'll separate into the dermatome and the myotome. But right now, at this initial stages, we call it the dermamyotome, which is just both of those regions together. 
One of the major inductive signals going on here is sonic hedgehog. So sonic hedgehog not only plays a key role in ventral patterning of the neural tube, but it also plays a key inductive role in making this, uh, this region of the somite become uh, cartilage, or and then bone, which is going to form the vertebral um, um, column. Okay? Without sonic hedgehog, you don't get uh, a formation of any cartilage and bone. Now, here's what happens. Initially, the outer layer of the somite is epithelial, and the inner layer is mesenchyme cells. But in the induction process, eventually these epithelial cells will become mesenchyme again, and they'll migrate out to where they need to go. You know, they'll undergo their gastrulation movements. So here's what happens, is the notochord induces the sclerotome to form, mainly by sonic hedgehog. Um, there are genes here in the upper region, such as noggin and gremlin, which block the BMP signalings that come from the roof plate. So we'll see how in a second that plays a key role because in some cases it's not all about inducing, it's all about preventing the induction of adjacent tissues that would normally cause them to uh, um, uh, differentiate into one thing or another. So here you can see that as gastrulation proceeds, initially they start off as epithelial cells, eventually they'll, they'll delaminate and become mesenchyme and start migrating into their respective positions. So here's where the sclerotome forms. Just above that, you can see that the myotome starts forming. The myoblast, these are what's going to form the musculature of the back and the rib cage uh, in the upper body. Um, and then the most dorsal region of the somites, we call this the dermatome. That's going to become part of the dermis the uh, uh, um, uh, region, dermal region, and it will also form kind of some um, epithelial cells uh, that surround some of the other uh, um, adjacent tissues. So let's look at the sclerotome, vertebrae and rib uh, cartilage. So here's the sclerotome starting to form. What happens is as the sclerotome starts to form into the uh, vertebrae, it allows for a lot of these axons from the neural tube to project out. Remember we talked about axon projection through the anterior region of the somites. Well, as these neurons project out, that's where these vertebrae are essentially going to form, giving passageway for the dorsal root ganglion to start forming and coming out as well as the uh, motor neurons. And these are going to synapse with the myotome, which are the muscles that are going to form and for the ribs and in the back. Um, and then those are going to associate with those as that undergoes its differentiation. So you can see that, in, in fact, the sclerotome will kind of split and fuse with the adjacent one to form the vertebrae in this regard. You don't get each one of these just forming a single vertebrae. You actually get a fusion between these two that are going to form and allow these axons to project through and synapse with their various muscles. And we talked about axon projection before. There is a region that forms just dorsal to the sclerotome that, that starts showing up a little bit later on called the syndotome. So here's the sclerotome. These are the cells becoming mesenchyme. Just dorsal to that, you get the syndotome. And they've shown that this comes about primarily because there's not as much sonic hedgehog that it's actually blocked in that region. And that causes this tiny band of cells in between the sclerotome and the myotome, which we call the syndotome, to become tendons, which are going to connect the vertebrae. Okay? These tendons are essentially going to, right here, going to connect the vertebral uh, columns as they're forming. So that's where the sclerotome comes from, is a blocking of the sonic hedgehog signaling in this tiny band of cells right between the myotome and the sclerotome, and that's going to you know, take part in the uh, development of your spinal column, but the tendons of that and not the bone. This is where sonic hedgehog plays a key role in the differentiation of the sclerotome, but not the, or the, the um, syndotome. Okay. Let's look at the myotome, which is the musculature of the back, the ribs, and of the limbs. So, even though the lateral plate mesoderm plays a key role in limb 
um, induction, they don't, uh, they're not the muscle of the limbs. It's the myotome which is going to contribute to the musculature of the limbs as it sends those uh, cells into there. So the myotome, this is just kind of an anatomy showing you how the muscles, you've got a wide variety of muscles. You've got uh, muscles that will pull up on your rib cage that are necessary for um, uh, increasing you know, lung capacity during heavy breathing and whatnot. You've got other uh, muscles that will pull down on your rib cage for uh, expelling. You do, most of your normal breathing comes from your diaphragm, but when you have you know, huge inhales and exhales, that's when you start bringing in your muscles um, that will pull up on your rib cage and pull down on your rib cage to increase lung capacity and uh, um, increase overall pressure uh, in and out. The back muscles, these again are going to connect with the vertebral column and with your rib cage. These are uh, most of the musculatures of the back. So all of this essentially comes from the myotome, just to illustrate. So let's look at the induction process of the myotome. And this is where we get into some stem cell research as well, as far as um, uh, how your muscles can regenerate themselves and, and what's going on here. Initially, we know that skeletal muscle fibers are these long fibers of, of multinucleated cells. So it's just one long continuous cell, but they don't start out that way. They actually start out as individual cells that start forming into these um, uh, long, um, uh, f uh, they fuse together into these long chains. So initially, the myotome, or these myoblasts, which are the precursor cells to your muscles, um, are individual cells with single nuclei. What they, what they do is they go through this inductive process, and you can just see some of the genes down here. I'm not too concerned with going through the step-by-step -step of the gene induction, but I do want to illustrate some of the dynamics of how the muscle actually forms, because this plays a key role in understanding how stem cells are maintained within your bone, or not your bone, your muscle, uh, necessary for regeneration uh, of your muscle uh, in your lifetime, and why muscle may not regenerate if you lose some of these stem cells. So here are the myotome cells. Due to the inductive signals of the, uh, um, uh, of the adjacent tissues of the ectoderm and the lateral plate mesoderm and the neural tube, um, they'll start becoming determined to divide into myoblasts. You can see just some of the inductive signals down here. Eventually, essentially, they line up. You've got cadherins, and you've got fibronectin. You've got all sorts of things that help them to line up. And then they fuse together, and they share one large cytoplasm. So that's how they initially become multinucleated. Um, now, eventually, as the muscles are getting longer, they, they, you get more nuclei, and you don't get cytokinesis occurring in the muscle fibers. But when these initial muscle fibers form, they form as individual cells, and then they fuse to become one long cell that's multinucleated. Now, one of the interesting things is some of these myoblasts don't fuse with the muscle fibers, and those become your adult stem cells in your muscle. And they're finding these to just sit right next to these muscle fibers or in between the muscle fibers, and they are the ones that are used to regenerate uh, muscle um, over the individual's lifetime. And if you lose those stem cells, then you not, might not be able to, or you not might, you won't be able to regenerate muscle tissue as it, uh, if it atrophies and whatnot. So they're showing that, that the initial stages of muscle development, this is where the stem cells form, is they don't fuse to form the long fibers, and they just sit there kind of right on top of it, right next to these uh, muscle fibers and in between, and they're starting to find where these are at in the muscle itself. 